If you live with BPD or CPTSD, or you just find that you're emotionally sensitive or easily dysregulated person, you most likely have troubles with emotional lability, the ability to keep your emotions at a level, probably anger issues, and you might find that oftentimes you're escalating situations from zero to 100 before even getting to that 5, 10, or 15 mark step in between that zero and 100. Perhaps people have even said to you, wow, that escalated quickly. Or maybe you hear things like, things always seem to escalate so quickly when you're around. These are definitely things that I've heard. In today's video, we're going to talk about how to appropriately escalate a situation, even when you're dysregulated, so that you can get what you want effectively and not cause yourself further emotional dysregulation. I'm going to talk about the contributing factors. There's only really two of them that lead to escalation. I'm going to give you some tips on how to properly deal with escalation. And finally, I'm gonna give you at least two or three different instances that I have personally dealt with that I really wanted to escalate and I didn't and why that worked for me. Let's get going. My name's Jen, you're watching BPD Woman. If you haven't done so already, please like, share, subscribe, comment below. On this channel, I offer you positive solution-based approaches to recovery from BPD, CPTSD, and you will also find assistance if you are a highly sensitive person. I'm not a life coach, a therapist, I'm none of that. However, with over 20 years of recovery under my belt with BPD, six rounds of DBT, in-person, book work, bibliographic work, um, online work, you get it. I'm really committed. I can give you the nuances and the real ins and outs on how to improve your BPD behaviors by being able to answer one simple question, which is, what's it like to have BPD? Let's get going. So I think a big thing for most of us is escalation, right? And when you're emotionally labeled, and emotionally lability means that you um, jump to and from emotions very quickly. So you may be very happy at noon, very angry at 1 p.m., very sad at 3 p.m., and they go up and down, right? Uh, you probably have found that with this comes a lot of escalation. And probably later you're like, oh my gosh, you know, you're sitting with regret. Why did I let it go that way? I feel embarrassed. That was way too much. Like I said, you've, you've probably heard people say things to you like, that really escalated quickly. Why did you let that get so out of hand? Things just seem to escalate so fast. These are things that I have heard people say to me. And so, you know, also contributing to this is anger, right? Um, or feeling that you are being victimized in some way. And you know what, you that makes sense that you would feel that way because you've been victimized for about 20 years growing up in your situation, which definitely contributed to your borderline personality disorder or whatever traumatic events led to your BPD or your CPTSD. So you're used to being the victim. You're used to people doing things to you. You're used to being a target of other people's toxicity or, or abuse, okay? I was. And... Um, and then you, you grow up in this chaotic environment where you don't have stability, you're not able to trust your emotions, nobody validates you. It's very confusing. You know, growing up, puberty, going into adulthood, that's all confusing on its own. But then when you throw in the, you know, absence of parents or the trauma, like, you know, no wonder you struggle. So anger, though, at least for me, I know not everybody with BPD has a big anger problem, but for me, that's been a real big thing. And with that anger and that impulsivity and acting out on things has led to a lot of situations that have become escalated that didn't need to go there. And then they either betrayed what I wanted to do, they made me feel bad about myself, people saw me in a different light, or I simply didn't get or accomplish what I set out to get or accomplish. And so on the road to recovery from BPD, learning how to escalate appropriately is really going to be a core component of your interpersonal effectiveness, getting what you want and feeling good about what you want. And so what are the contributing factors? You know, why do we escalate so quickly, right? Okay, so there's two or three that are really important. First of all, it's that emotional ability, right? That, you know, you can change emotions quickly 
and um, with a lot of varying degrees in a very short amount of time. So it can be very unpredictable, not only for you, but for other people. Like what she was happy this morning, why is she, you know, so depressed now? Um, second, um, it comes down to cognitive distortions, particularly personalization and catastrophizing. And I've done a video on cognitive distortions that would be probably very beneficial uh, as a intro to this video. So, so check those out. I'll put up a link. But catastrophizing is, is thinking the worst, right? It's, oh my gosh, I haven't heard from the doctor. You know, I'm, I'm going to die. Um, I haven't got my period. I must be pregnant. Um, you know, uh, my boss called me into his office. I'm totally getting fired. These are situations that you are going to the, right? The worst possible explanation. Um, the, the second cognitive distortion that's, that's mixed in there with catastrophizing is personalization. So you take it personally. Any look someone gives you, any outcome of a situation, um, what somebody may say to you in passing, something that happens to you during your day, you take that as personally. You see that through a lens of that must have to do with me. And finally, third, and this is something that I've said many, many times in my videos, is that you find it hard to sit in the gray zone. The gray zone, the, the gray zone, the gray zone, the gray zone opens up so many portals to your BPD recovery when you're able to finally get there. Uh, the not being able to sit with things, the not being able to let things play out, the impatience of waiting for a response. Um, it's hard to sit with that ambiguity. And it's hard to sit with that ambiguity because all you did was grow up with ambiguity. What's going to happen to me now? Who's going to be yelling? What are my parents going to say to me? How am I going to do this? You know, how am I going to get through this? Is there going to be enough food for tomorrow? Will I make friends? You know, it, it goes into this anxiety thing. And that's how you condition yourself to live, right? You know, it's 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 a crude comparison, but it's sort of like conditioning a dog, right? You get a dog, you train a dog, and either you, you really keep up with practicing how to discipline and train your dog, and it becomes a great dog, and you can let it off leash, and it sits, and it does everything that you want, or you give no attention to it at all, and you let it do whatever it wants, and when you let it off its leash, what happens? It runs away, right? It jumps on people. It barks. It has bad behaviors. It destroys things. So, you know, people only know what they've been taught. Same thing with animals. So whatever you've grown up accustomed to being around, learning English, living in an, in an abusive environment, that's what you're going to take with you as you get older. So how to combat these contributing factors is first, you know, learning how to de-escalate this catastrophizing thinking and this personalization. And in my catastrophizing cognitive distortion video, you know, there were three things that I found in an article once that helped me check my catastrophizing, which really has kept helping me throughout the years. The first is, is it happening right now? Right? So checking the facts, like, is this happening right now? Am I actually being fired, right? Okay, if it's not happening, the second question is to ask myself, well, then am I, you know, causing my own suffering? So if I'm not really being fired right now, I seem to be spinning myself up and focusing on this. What skill is out there for me that I can distract myself, right? And get off of this worry wart cycle about my job or whatever my boss wants to talk about. And the third thing is telling yourself, I can handle this. I can handle anything that comes my way. Okay, if I get tr in trouble at work, let's say worst case scenario, I can fix it. You know, if I get fired or laid off or I become unemployed, I will work it out. I've always worked it out. I'm a tough, badass motherfucker. I'm going to figure it out, right? So that's how to combat catastrophizing. Personalization, that takes a little bit longer. And there's actually a book I recommend, and I've recommended it before. It's called Self-Esteem. There's the, there's the book there, okay? This is an old edition. But there's a lot of great exercises in there and how to actually combat some of these distortions. And personalization is hard. It takes a long time. I also recommend a second book that will talk about taking things personally, and that's The Four Agreements. 
and that's this book here by Don Miguel Ruiz. And one of the four agreements is never to take anything personally. And it really delves into why, you know, why people do things has almost nothing to do with you, everything to do with them. I mean, people, you know, you may be thinking, oh my God, people are lo looking at me because I, they think I look fat or they think I didn't dress well. Most people are concerned about that themselves. They think they don't look good, right? Unless they have like a really solid sense of self, you know, that may be something that um, is taking over. Again, the personalization is taking over when it's not warranted or it's not appropriate. But really learning to not take things personally, um, it's really tied into your self-esteem and your self-worth, right? So, you know, if somebody in the past would say something to me like, um, you know, no, I don't want to go there with you. You know, I'd be like, oh, well, I'm looking forward to it. I like my own company and I'm going to have a great time. Right. But the way to get there is through years of self-validation, years of, of doing things in line with your ethics. You know, I keep saying that if you want to feel good about yourself, the, the quickest way to feel good about yourself is to do things that make you feel masterful, ethical, and that are in your that are in your bounds. For instance, I did a house sit last night and, you know, she was very accommodating. She put out all cookies and, you know, it was only one night, so I didn't shower at their place, but um, I've run out of like the usual soap. I use Dove. I, I ran out of it at my own place. And, it, and at her, in the guest bathroom, she had laid out all of these towels and this bar of Dove soap. I didn't use it because I didn't have to. And, you know, I looked underneath the sink for something and there was like, you know, 10 or 15 bars of this Dove bar soap. So, you know, she just probably just has it there for guest visits. And I said to myself, you know, I could take this, you know, I, she's giving it to me for free. You know, she's letting me use it. Um, she probably wouldn't miss it because she has 10 or 15 other bars. Um, I need it. And I thought, no, I don't, this isn't mine. I don't need it. That would be an extra that I don't really need to go to. I have a couple of soaps at home and I'll get it, you know, I'll get my Dove soap later. That's an example of doing something that makes you feel good, that gives you mastery, that knows, okay, I've lived within my ethics and my bounds. Okay. Um, and again, third, you know, that ambiguity and the not knowing that really leads to escalation um, really comes down to learning to say to yourself, I don't have all the facts and I'm going to have to let it play out or something similar. I'm not really sure that that's the case right now. I don't really know that for a fact. Letting things play out. We want things to be known to us immediately. We grew up not knowing. We grew up not knowing all of the time. That created nothing but anxiety. So now we live very sometimes rigid lives where we need to know what's gonna happen. What's the next thing? What's the next thing? You know, some people take that to the way, way other degree and they develop, you know, OCD type behaviors. So those are the ways to combat. Now let me give you some examples of what appropriate and inappropriate escalation looks like using some of my own real world examples. Okay, so again, escalation appropriately is not only something that's taught in DBT, but you could find other ways to, you know, appropriately um, look at a situation. And, and the whole reason that you want to escalate appropriately is because you want to get what you need effectively, maintain your relationships, feel good about yourself, and maintain your emotional stability and, you know, come off the emotional ability. Um... Something that happens oftentimes with me, if I don't, if I've completed a service, right, or if I've been walking a dog, I have a Google business page and I'll ask people to leave me a review. And I often check the Google reviews to me. I've never had a bad one in three years, but you know, I'll check them. I want to be like, okay, did I get one? Is What if they say something bad? You know, maybe there's like a minor... I don't know, miscommunication, or I haven't heard from them, and I should have heard from them, but I haven't, or they haven't paid me. You know, sometimes people pay me a whole day late, and I'm like, oh my God, do they hate me? Do they not like me? Right? And that's what? That's catastrophizing. That's me thinking they don't like me. And then I think, okay, well, if they leave me a bad review, I'm going to write myself a, um, 
I'm going to write myself a response right now so that I can get on top of this. Right. And so I'm already like writing a response to a review, a negative review that hasn't even been posted. I have no idea what's in this person's head. Right. And so who am I affecting in that whole cycle? Me. I'm affecting me in that cycle. Right. So that that's how that that escalation, that worry and not knowing with that ambiguity, like works its its way up. So, you know, I, instead, now I'll be like, okay, I don't know why I haven't heard from them. I'm going to let that play out. I'm not really sure what's happening. Okay. If they leave me a negative review, first of all, that's, that's unlikely to happen. You know, they would have said something to me first. And if they do, okay, I'll take care of it. You know, that I'll go with, okay, well, I've had 155 star reviews. You'd be the first one star review. So, I mean, I think that speaks for itself, right? Um, another escalation that you may find is with texting. Texting is a big one, right? So like your friend doesn't return your texts. Maybe they drop off for days and days. So I've been through this a few times with a friend of mine who really suffers from intense depression. And we've probably been friends on and off about 10 years now. And he'll go through these cycles where like, he just drops off text and I'm not hearing from him, but I know he's like, you know, talking to other people. And then I start to feel like, well, you're not meeting my needs. Like maybe I need to talk to somebody. Why are we only talking about your problems? And again, I've created a video about friendship. There's a whole um, folder about friendship that I've created. You know, friendship is give and take. So I have legitimate, you know, points that I need somebody to be there for me to, to ask me how I'm doing. Um, and so, um, in the past, you know, if I sent a text and it was a day or two and I didn't hear something, I would send another text like, oh, we'll ignore this text too, you know, or I'd say something mean or I'd say something snarky, then he would get mad, then I would get mad, then I'd block him. And this has happened to us twice. And so recently he came back in my life again and, um, and you know. We started out good. We had the long phone calls. We had the joking back and forth. Everything was great and fine. And then Reese and I told him, and one of the ways that I headed this off this time was like, listen, the whole reason that we stopped talking last time is because you basically just dropped off the face of the earth. I had no idea what was going on. I got very mad. I got very angry. I took it personally. You know, I feel like you have time for other people. He's like, okay. He's like, I totally understand. He's like, if I feel like I'm getting depressed again this time, I'm going to let you know, you know, and he's done that. He's done that a few times. And over the last month, he's been going through something when a, a long-term relationship of his broke up. And, um, but again, I haven't felt like he's reaching out to me to ask me what I need. Like he'll say, okay, like I've, I've, you know, fell, fallen off the face of the earth. I'm really sorry. Hope you're well. Well, that's not really checking on how I'm doing, right? He's just letting me know why he can't talk to me, even though he can do other things. So, you know, I was like, over the last few days, I was like, well, I'm going to tell him that this isn't working for me. And here we go again. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to text him and I'll be like, this is the same bullshit that happened last time and the time before. And then I thought, okay, what are my goals here? Right? I want to keep this friendship. I don't know that he's really dissing me. Right? I have a legitimate claim to have reciprocal needs met in this relationship. Um, so how can I escalate appropriately? Right? Um, and instead of putting it all in a text, which can be very convoluted anyway, I simply asked him, hey, do you have time to get on the phone? Done. And he did. And we got on the phone and we cleared everything up and I felt a lot better. So that was going to that second step, right? So the first step was wondering, okay, what's going on? The 10th step would be to, you know, send an angry email or text or yell on the phone. But the second step to pro is to gather the information, okay? Think, okay, what's the most effective way to communicate with him? Well, putting something very long on a text doesn't really seem to be the way here. So why don't I ask him if he can get on the phone with me and like, go that way? Um, emails are another big thing, right? You may not hear back from somebody. And so you develop um, a conclusion in your head of why you haven't heard from this person. And you send them an angry email and they're like, where the fuck did that come from? Right? Um, 
one time I didn't hear back from a friend and, and it was because his baby had died. Right. And I didn't know because I'm not on Facebook and he had announced it on Facebook and I didn't know. And I felt like a total asshole. Right. So it's it's a lot of information gathering. It's, of course, dealing with that, you know, the personalization, the catastrophizing, being able to sit in the gray zone, not drawing conclusions and asking yourself that information. What's going on here or telling yourself, I don't know this. Let me find out the facts. I promise you. These are the ways to appropriate escalation and even writing them out, you know, let's say you take in your car, right? And, and something gets fixed. You spend a bunch of money, but then they haven't fixed the problem. And now they have a thousand dollars worth of your money. So, you know, think about what an appropriate escalation would be, right? Call them. Hey, this hasn't worked. This has happened to me, right? Hey, this, this, the, you've not fixed this correctly. Okay, bring it back. We'll check it again. Okay, usually that, that fixes it. But the second time, you know, maybe you bring it back and they don't fix it. And you're like, look, this still hasn't fixed it. I'd like my money back. They say, no, we will not give you your money back. Okay, so then you ask to speak to like the owner, right? Maybe that's the next step. And the owner says, no, we're not giving you back your money. Okay, so then the next step may be to contact MasterCard, right? Try to dispute the charge. MasterCard won't help you. Okay, what's the next step? you know, go to court, <laughs> go to small claims court, leave a Google review. These are all ways that escalate appropriately. You wouldn't immediately threaten legal action, right? It may be tempting because you think it'll fear or bully them into giving you the kind of response that you want. But, but would it work on you? Would somebody threatening you with harm or verbal abuse or litigation, would that work on you? wouldn't work on me. My name is Jen. You've been watching BPD Woman. We've been talking about how to appropriate escalate when you're dysregulated, how to get what you want effectively. Leave me a comment below. And as always, until I see you next time, please be effective. Bye-bye.